explain in math, and we have one for assistive technology. Um, for you, for you guys who are not aware of what assistive technology is, is basically any device, software, hardware that can help enhance and make a, stu a student with disability make their college career or their life a lot simpler and they can have a, a very good experience like a person without a disability. Um, there are softwares from JAWS, which is a screen reader, to read and writing software, but we get into that a little later. So um, we also have a stress ball and we have some pens. Um, every year, for the past uh, six years, we actually have our own conference. It's called the CUNY Accessibility Conference. All the conference just passed to us on, on May 1st, 2015 at John Day. Next year is going to be May 6th. If you guys like to attend the conference, you can um, give me a business card or I can have a piece of paper and write down your email information. I can um, provide you guys with, the, with the further details. Also, if you visit us at catsweb.cuny.edu, it's also on the flyer. You can subscribe to our news feed, and whenever anything is posted, you guys will receive an email, and you guys can keep up to date as well. So this is Tanya, and she will speak a little about the Media Accessibility Project. So hello, everyone. Um, I was introduced as the lead captionist for the Media Accessibility Project, but I also address accessibility on a larger scale, um, and that's what MAP does. And we, we address accessibility using Microsoft Word documents, Microsoft PowerPoint documents, PDFs, and video and audio content. And uh, providing captions for video and audio content, um, making sure um, your documents are accessible by screen readers or accessible to those who have various disabilities. And accessibility really goes under universal design. Is everyone familiar with universal design? Yeah, when you make your, uh, when you make course content accessible, you want to keep in mind of the students that um, who have various abilities and disabilities, who have various learning styles, um, who have various um, language skills, maybe English isn't their first language, so you want to keep that in mind. And accessibility really clears a pathway for everyone. Um, what else should I mention? Well, we can, you know, we mention some more stuff later on, but then time, you know, I'm uh, Antonia Levy, and I was introduced as a manager, but <laughs> what I am really um, is uh, I work in instructional technology and um, faculty development. We're like a united department um, at SPS, what is mostly an online or hybrid school. So we deal with online education almost all the time. Um, most of what happens on Blackboard, obviously. So um, I got thrown into the accessibility role kind of uh, by necessity when our student services department approached us and said, you know, we have accessibility issues with Blackboard. Can you, as a as Blackboard admin, please help us? And so I started um, exploring that more, and it has led to an intense collaboration with that department, but has been very productive. We um, really approached this topic from both sides, from a faculty development perspective, as well as or working with faculty, right, as well as um, serving the needs of students, all kinds of students. And um, we have um, presented at the Accessibility Conference, at the IT Conference. We're um, working with Katz and Matt and with Carlos and um, other accessibility um, advocates around CUNY, and it's been an amazing experience. I'm pretty new to the topic, and um, I must say, the people working in that area are amazing. Um, and so, you know, I feel in an online environment, uh, the instructor is much more the creator of that environment than in a face-to-face -face environment where, you know, your disability your department is probably gonna take care of a lot of things already. Um, but in an online environment, it's first of all your LMS, your learning management system, right? That will be here accessible or not. And Blackboard is, you know, accessible and then you have all kinds of problems <laughs> that you encounter when you try to um, navigate it with the screen reader. But then um, it's the instructors who post content. And as Tanya said, you know, it needs to be accessible. If there is someone in your class with all kinds of, you know, um, accessibility needs, your content needs to be accessible to them. So this includes PDFs, videos, you know, they need to be captioned, um, um, Word document, PowerPoint slides, right? 
Um, thinking about images is a whole other issue. Um, you know, we love posting images, they look pretty, but uh, for someone who's blind, they don't mean nothing. Or you need to explain them <laughs> in, in a lot of detail. Um, so uh, I feel, um, you know, working in collaboration and approaching um, this topic um, from a universal design perspective on all kinds of levels makes a lot of sense. So I always think about it as a holistic approach that not just your school with ramps and elevators is accessible, but everything, you know, the way we approach students, the way we write to them, the way we um, teach them, right? So um, it's it's been a great adventure and uh, I am, I've become an advocate, I think, <laughs> for these amazing folks. Okay, so you guys are probably thinking, you know, why are we here? Why are we going to explain work? Please come, come in. in. Come, come in. in. <laughs> oh, we're so big. Okay. You guys are thinking, you know, why are we here? Why are we talking about online accessibility? You know, um, if a student has a disability, they a certain disability that shouldn't take an online class. No, that's not true. You know, you clear the pathway for one, you clear it for all. So the first thing you look at when you create your online course content is, is it accessible? If it's accessible, everyone can use it. Um, majority of classes now are going online because everyone is becoming more busier. Family members, everyone's a, a parent or just don't have the time to sit in the classroom for two, three hours when they can be doing something else. So I'm gonna, we're gonna show you guys a quick video from Portland University that will clarify some questions that you guys may have about um, online accessibility. I'm sight impaired and uh, I have RP, which is retinitis pigmentosa, and it's as if I'm looking through straws. Uh, for a sighted student, uh, they can just see what's there on the page and click on whatever they need and they can go back and forth to the syllabus and back to the page very easily. I have to navigate back and forth and run up and down the page with a JAWS program that takes a lot longer. Today, everyone uses computers, and PCC students use computers extensively to access online content via the web. But for students with a disability, this can present enormous challenges that we really need to address. Daniel Turnbull is one of our students who faces enormous obstacles due to his visual disability. The major that I've chosen is psychology. Uh, I want to be a uh, counselor for people with uh, disabilities. I'm Kendra Colley. I'd like to talk with you today about implementing some new standards to ensure that all of our online content is accessible to all of our students. I think that the frustration that I observe with students with disabilities is that they can't, they can't complete the assignments. They've got this time set aside and they're not able to do the work. You see other students participating in the discussion. You want to participate. You have a limited time to participate, but you can't do that because you haven't been able to watch the film that you need to watch in order to participate. Some of the problems that I have are that there are no captions, that there are no transcripts available. So if it's not captioned, they should at least have a file available so that I can read what's being said and then try to fit that in with the video, read it at the same time that I'm watching the video. Well, I have to work more closely with my instructors and see if either they can give me um, another assignment or if something that I can learn from another video or sometimes I need to set up time with an interpreter to meet with them and have them interpret the videos 
sit down with them and have them interpret the videos. So it's almost pointless because sometimes I have to come here to campus anyway, even though I'm taking a class that's supposed to be on, online. I don't like having to go and get my counts, a counselor or uh, get disability assistance to come and help me because all I need is just just the voice the voice that's on the video to be captioned. I should be able to email the instructor and they should be able to, to have, have, fix it right away because other students can listen to their assignments, can listen to the information that's on the internet and if the instructor um, notices that there's something wrong with the audio, they can fix it right away. If, if there's no um, captioning, you know, on the video, then we're not going to be learning anything from what you're saying on the, the video. So it's very important that you um, have captioning um, because we can really be involved, you know, what's happening in the world and in classrooms or whatever. It's very important. Um, my goal is to take a PhD in physics or math. Because I'm physically impaired, I can't use my hands. Um, I use the computer exclusively to do my homework and to access content from PCC. It is my connection to the outside world. It connects me to my family, my friends, to the school. Um, Without a computer, um, I would be pretty much stuck. The most frustrating thing that I've encountered um, at PCC are the PDFs that you have to download instead of being able to fill out the form online. Because once I download the file, I have to find someone to fill it out for me, which could take uh, days. It's frustrating um, when a lot of the websites time out on you and I have to re-log in multiple times. People that use the computer use the mouse all the time and um, don't really recognize the fact that without a mouse, the computer is very hard to use and dragging and dropping is almost impossible to do with the mouse stick without the use of your hands. So any um, program that you need to drag and drop is almost inaccessible to someone with a disability. I am picking a time that I want the light flash and solving for negative k at this point. When I'm taking tests at school, they give me three times the amount of time that a regular student has to take the test, and it's not because I need more time to think about it, it's all entering the data into the computer. The, the reason we need to be ready for these changes is not just because of the laws, but you as an instructor have to think about when a student comes to your class, are you going to say to them, I'm sorry, um, you can't watch the video. We have, to, we have to make sure all of our classes are accessible to everyone. It just, it just makes sense. Helping all of our students reach their educational goals is a shared responsibility. The Departments of Instructional Support and Distance Learning have been working on guidelines and information about how this can be done more easily. It's not so difficult. For example, course materials can be designed so that they are easily accessible. The Departments of Instructional Support and Distance Learning will be here to provide training, to provide support, provide some of the, uh, the actual technical pieces of doing things such as putting captioning on videos. Um, Anything to make sure that all of the materials that go online are accessible. We'll be starting with new courses. So as courses are, are developed for an online environment, the materials need to be made accessible. I believe that as an instructor, I want my students to be successful.
I want to give them the tools necessary for them to achieve. And this is one of the ways. This ensures that all students have the opportunity to be successful and not just those students that don't have a disability. It does matter because everybody should be included and nobody should be excluded for any reason. So even though it's a small portion of the population of the school, they have every right to be successful as anyone else. There are a lot of disabilities out there, some that we're aware of and some that we're not aware of. So I think the changes we make for the students who have real strong barriers will help the students with maybe lesser barriers or students who have no identified barriers at all. So I do think that the changes we make will, will help our courses just be more accessible to all students. I mean, I think you as a teacher need to decide, are you going to open the door or are you going to shut the door? Are you going to provide an academic experience for somebody or not? A key part of PCC's mission is delivering accessible and quality education. Making sure that all of our online materials are accessible is important and it's the right thing to do. We need to help our students, all of our students, meet their educational goals. If I was able to take online classes without somebody helping me navigate all the time and I could do it independently, it would mean the world to me. I wouldn't have to like call a friend and have them uh, tan them in and uh, view my screen for me so they could help me navigate through the site, wasting their time and mine. If I can't find somebody with eyesight to help me navigate the pages, I either fail or get an incomplete. Yeah, I believe I get to do school a lot faster. I mean, at this rate, it's going to take me forever. Designing an accessible online curriculum means your courses will serve a broader audience. Students with disabilities, ESOL students, and students with different learning styles will all benefit. Accessibility is a very important issue for all community colleges because an average of 12% of the community college students are disabled. This is an initiative we must move ahead on. Not only is it a policy of access at PCC, but it's the law. We are committed to making all course content accessible to everyone. It is the mission of PCC, and there is no success without access. So, for example, for videos, it should start from the creator of the video. It should start with the caption. It. Then it works its way down to uh, IT, and then it goes down to the well, no, instructors, and then IT, and then the disability services. The reason why disability services are last is because all campuses are not fully staffed with, um, well, fully staffed, and have tr people that's trained to do these captioning. IT is really large in every campus. So it should start from there. But you guys are pretty much have the good idea. So. <laughs> and, and maybe I can jump in with uh, experience from our campus. So um, we, first of all, tell instructors that they should only link to videos that are captioned, right? Not all videos. You, you cannot really caption videos that are not yours, right? I mean, you could, but it takes quite some shuffling. But um, so that's the first rule. 
And then if you create your own videos, what we encourage um, online instructors to do, right? Like lectures or instructor introductory videos where they actually show themselves to their students once at least a semester. Um, we right now, and I know you don't like me to say that necessarily, but right now we teach our faculty how to use the YouTube um, captioning tool. YouTube actually has a very intuitive captioning um, tool uh, that, you know, works fast, I mean, kind of, when you think about captioning, I don't know if you've ever captioned a video, but it takes some time, um, and, um, you know, works works pretty well, it's easy to teach. Um, I know that uh, QE and um, is uh, having, the, has their own um, captioning software. Do you want to talk about that? Or you, you oh, actually. <laughs> well, let me just mention one thing. As far as captioning is concerned, if you're captioning a video for educational purposes, there is no copyright laws. But if you caption it for other purposes, then you'll have to get permission from mm -hmm. the producers and so on mm -hmm. before you can actually caption the video. So someone else is basically, right? Yeah. 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 Right. So you can use YouTube to caption videos. Um, but you can also use a software called Movie Captioner. Has anyone heard of it? Well, Movie Captioner is just a captioning software. It's not a video editing software or anything like that. It just provides captions to video, closed captions. Does anyone know what closed captions and open captions are? No, <laughs> <laughs> Well, open captions are um, embedded into the video, so you can't turn them off. And uh, closed captions, you can toggle them on or off. And so, movie caption provides closed captions. And it's a great tool because you can not only caption videos, but you can export transcripts, you can import transcripts. Um, let's say if you're captioning a video on YouTube, you can actually take the transcript from YouTube and import it into Movie Captioner and do some editing in there. Also, there's a loop feature in Movie Captioner. So um, what it is is, let's say you put it to loop for four seconds, it'll repeat that four seconds. So you don't have to pause and type, pause and type, and then press enter. It just loops, and then you type the caption, you press enter, and then it moves on. Uh, also, the, the good thing about movie caption, and also as CAS, when we purchase a software or hardware, we tend to purchase for the entire university. And we also, as far as software is concerned, we tend to purchase um, university licenses. So for movie caption, we did have a, a university unrestricted license. So if anyone would like a copy of it, it's a faculty or staff member, you can visit your disability department and they can um, either if IT controls their softwares or if they have someone in your office that does it, you can bring your laptop and it will be able to install it on the laptop for you. Um, so, and it's uh, available for Mac, yeah. Yeah, and there's more description about movie capturing. So, you guys have any questions? I work in the disability office at City College, and one thing that I've heard from faculty is that they, they know that the best practice is to caption it, but if they're generating their own videos, that can take a lot of time, and there's some frustration that if there's not someone who is adhering in that group, why, why are they going through the time to put that in? And I'm just curious where you sort of fall on that. Well, this is where um, universal design comes in handy, because right. captions not only benefit those who are hard of hearing, but those who are learning disabled. You know, it helps all students. It helps their um, uh, retention, their comprehension. Yeah, it is there, have been, there have been lots of studies that show that captioning increases comprehension of material. So any instructor who is really trying to reach their students would benefit from captioning video yeah. material. Well, you know, I think, yeah, I think ESL students, for example, I mean, when I came here, I was very uh, appreciative of captions, also when there is terminology. You know, when you hear it, you, you, I don't retain it. I, if, but if I read it, I do. So the combination of that, so I, I feel that's a way of getting getting faculty because I think all faculty deal with ESL at, at some point. Right. And not, not so, all students also identify the disability. Right. It could be a learning disability they have, but it doesn't have to be any other, like, any physical disability that you see. A great couple, question. A couple of things that I would just like to add to that is that with the captioning, um, I actually taught a course this semester and I used some YouTube videos in the course and many of them, and they were disability related because it was a disability themed class, 
many of them were not captioned. I was actually really shocked. And they were they were they were disability videos, um, like TED Talks, and, and and I was really really surprised. Um, so uh, and the other thing is that with with the captioning, we had uh, a student at BCC who was deaf, and she took a video uh, a movie course this sem last semester, and the professor was able to actually get transcripts from the internet. So. In this video, that did you hear the student saying, "Oh, if only there was a tr at least a transcript. If I couldn't, you know, if they, if they couldn't transcribe it." So now that's also very useful too, because you can Google that and get a lot of movies do have actual transcript. And she she did great. She got a B plus in, in the class. She, she did really well. And talking about transcript, what we encourage our faculty to do is actually writing a script when they do a video. You know, um, write it out before, and especially if you will start out. And you can copy and paste that, for example, in, in YouTube into this little tool and it will sync it and then you basically just edit it um, while, you, while you walk through it. It really saves work in, in the way, but, but you know, then you obviously have that other issue that sometimes this can sound really mechanic if someone just reads it out. So, you know, um, but we, that is one way of maybe um, um, making that a little easier. Uh, was it, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but was it that Portland Community College not captioned for our hands on it. Well, and we captured it. We captured it. Yeah, no, that's that. I know. I know because I'm. I found that video. And it yeah. wasn't captured. No, we actually captured. It was about disability, and it wasn't captioned. Yeah. Is that so, first so the math project captioned it. Yeah. So even even the practitioners mm -hmm. forget. Mm -hmm. and so. You know. Um. Oh, sorry. Oh, I just wanted to um, talk a little about our, our initiatives at, at SPS. Um, <laughs> um, so we we started thinking about okay, how can we? We also we don't, we don't have the manpower to do it all. I mean, we can't caption every single video that's produced in our school. We can't um, you know make picky apps. We just don't. Um, so we started thinking about um, empowering our faculty in a way that we're gonna we gonna start trainings on accessibility in general, universal design, and also teaching, we already started teaching hands-on classes on how to caption using YouTube, how to make your syllabus accessible, and then how do you actually create accessible PDFs from Word documents or PowerPoints and all these things. So we started doing that, and then um, there's a group of um, Blackboard admins and um, disability and assistive technology um, um, people who are working together to create um, a self-paced faculty workshop for all of CUNY. So that's in the works. And I know Carlos wanted us to mention this. We actually um, applied for a grant. And so if you're interested in doing a project on this and getting some money um, from the CUNY Strategic Technology Initiative for Accessibility. So um, we hope to get some money for someone who can help us because we're all very busy. Um, this was a very slow-paced process. And at some point, Carlos approached and was like, what do you need? And so we, we applied for some money to get someone to help us to put the workshop together. Um, again, it will be community-wide, but um, there is some information up here. If you have you know, projects that on your, at your school that you would like some help with, or I don't know, Carlos, do you want to say something else about that? Or I, I, The only thing I would say is um, in the last year that there has been growing momentum within CUNY IT, address this problem of accessibility across CUNY, primarily driven by two things, uh, lawsuits, a lot of universities have gotten sued and they've had to respond. And the other thing is that more and more courses are going online or, or hybrid courses. You know, we have over almost 10,000 students in CUNY that have a disability and those are the ones who've identified themselves. There are a lot of other students who may not be uh, diagnosed with a di disability, but would benefit from the same tools that students with disabilities can use. So um, there's a lot of momentum. This RFP that's going around is for a fund of a million dollars to be spent over the next three years. Your campuses have money that perhaps you can tie into, and all your all, all, all of your campuses have uh, disability services or accessibility services. So this is a huge deal, right? And there's a million moving parts to it. So starting your disability services office, 
contact the catch project, uh, contact Matt, and uh, pick up bits and pieces that might apply to your daily work. And um, before you know it, you'll be an accessibility evangelist. Okay, does anyone have any questions so far? So yeah, so the brochures are going around. Um, you guys can brush up on assistive technology. Can I ask another question? Yeah, sure. Oh, sure. What, what role do you play in CUNY? Or whatever, uh, not with CUNY, I'm with the DOE. Uh -huh. So I work with high schools. Okay. Okay. So my high school students uh, would, be, would benefit from knowing that these are the options available okay. and how do they access them if they don't have, you know, if a teacher has not put something up, how do they? access something like this so teaching them how to advocate for themselves for you know for accessibility mm -hmm. right. it would be my kind of support for my students and also how do we bring similar components to high schools where students are struggling how you know when i took saw that the heart the information movie captioning you know high school teachers also put up videos on youtube and stuff for the students to access it but how do you know I haven't heard of it, you know, it's being used in high school, it's universal design as well. So we need to start them early and say these are all these options available. High school teachers could benefit from it too. Right. So and actually we we at SPS are also thinking, I mean our next step will be to actually bring the students in and, and get 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 feedback on how we're doing and what could be improved, you know. Um, from the actual students who are affected. We also, we um, just um, got, again, approval to employ um, a blind assistive technology um, specialist who helps us a lot with testing stuff in Blackboard, testing new tools. He helped me so much, I'm, I'm, I'm so grateful that he's there because um, some of it is just, uh, you know, for a seeing person, for example, it's, it's really hard to kind of like just comprehend what, what, what all of that means, so yeah. It's, it's I would suggest that you go home Turn on your computer, turn off your monitor, and try to read your email. Yeah. And you'll get a sense of what it can be like, not only for a blind student, but for students with other disabilities. Right. The, the, the irony is that there are plenty of tools that would allow you to do that, and people don't know about them. So. Okay, one, one more question. I actually had the pleasure of getting a tool a while back at Outside of captioning and videos, I know that there are many you know, um, colleges and universities that are creating online courses that are very interactive in nature, mm -hmm. very mouse trick. Mm -hmm. uh, and that seems to be a big issue, uh, especially when we were first creating the contracts with these companies to, to make these courses. Is the university doing anything to kind of come up with a best practice? Well, yeah. You know, yeah, that, that's the group that Antonio and I and a couple other individuals, Albert from Post Coast, that's currently what we're working on. So we come up with best practices, we're creating videos, we have um, links. So before you go, before a faculty member or anyone go ahead and create an online content, course content, you should first have, like, read through this checklist and make sure to have all of it implemented. Mm -hmm. um, we, for example, we've started using VoiceThread at our, yeah. I don't know, Anyone who used yeah. knows that tool, but um, we have actually uh, uh, integration in Blackboard. And one of the things that I talked at length with the person who is our, you know, uh, helps us out as a support person, is you know fair accessibility um, approach and features. It's not perfect. This is a very interactive tool, very image based, um, and they're trying, <laughs> but um, it it has its limits. So you know, it's. it's I mean, I think everyone is kind of trying to figure this out right now. And uh, educational um, resources and tools, they are very, the um, developers are very aware of the issues and, you know, there are legal requirements, but it's a moving target. And at CUNY, with the task force, because um, I think you also are hitting on the procurement part. Mm -hmm. If we're buying inaccessible technology and then trying to retrofit it, 
will never catch up, right? So one of the threads, and again, you know, CUNY is a big machine and things move slowly. One of the threads is to make sure that if we buy or develop technology that's going to be used in these environments, that it be tested and, and, and accessible. But, you know, that's a target right now. We're not there yet. And also, sometimes they'll say it's accessible, and it's not. Right, because these are voluntary you know, voluntary disclosures. We're not, mm -hmm. And what, what the change in mentality has been is that CUNY is a huge revenue source for a lot of these companies. And if you right. threaten to withhold purchasing because your product's not accessible, that should move them a little bit closer to being accessible. Yeah. Yeah. No, I agree. Um, what, but that was politics. Yeah. Well, you know, myself, I had a great impact on a couple of vendors that we deal with. You know, as I just I mentioned earlier, when we purchase, we try to purchase from inside university, 20 something campuses, 23, 24 campuses. One vendor was giving us a hard time. He said, no, you only sell single user license or 10 pack license. I was like, listen, we have a couple hundred thousand students. We can't buy 10 pack license. We're going to go broke. <laughs> So he went back to his bosses and they actually created a university license based off of the information that I gave him and for Q. So we work hard for our students, you know. We don't just come to work and do anything. Uh, and it shows we do have weight. I mean, we're big enough that we do have weight. Um, we also repressured some um, um, publishers to caption their videos, um, you know, because instructors were using them and in the disability studies department and couldn't, uh, you know, Once you keep the pressure on, they will respond. Yes, yes, it takes pressure. It, yeah, they don't it want to lose Kimmy as, <laughs> as a customer. Right. And, and it can't just come from disability services or Queensboro. It has to come from all of us, from professors, from faculty, from everybody that was involved in, in the university. Um, so I think we're, we're pretty much we're done. Um, so thank yeah, you. yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for our panel.